Welcome to People, Places, Planet Pod, the official podcast of the Environmental Law Institute, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization working to ensure a healthy environment, prosperous economies, and vibrant communities founded on the rule of law. Welcome to this week's episode of the People, Places, Planet Podcast, and happy International Women's Day. My name is Georgia Ray, and I am your host. Today, I have two ELI staff members with me, Elizabeth Cook, a Senior Manager of International Programs, and Jessica Troll, a Senior Attorney and Director of our International Water Program. Jessica has led ELI's International Water Program since its founding in 2006. She has over 20 years of experience working globally in partnership with governments, NGOs, the private sector, and universities to help create, implement, and enforce equitable and sustainable water laws, policies, and institutions. Elizabeth is a senior manager on ELI's international programs, centered on environmental peacebuilding and international water initiatives. She has more than 15 years of experience supporting innovative environmental peacebuilding engagements with a focus on water, women, and security. I am lucky to be speaking with Elizabeth and Jessica today, International Women's Day. They are in New York City, preparing for a number of UN-related events pertaining to women and water. The 67th session of the UN Commission on the Status of Women is already underway and concludes March 17th. Days later, the UN 2023 Water Conference will take place March 22nd through March 24th. ELI is a co-convener for side events taking place as part of both of these momentous gatherings. Today, we will discuss two priority engagements of ELI's international water initiatives that will also be highlighted in ELI official side events. First, strengthening the recognition and protection of water tenure of the world's most vulnerable populations. And second, the importance of inclusive decision-making in water diplomacy processes and the resultant positive implications for regional peace and human security. Elizabeth and Jessica, thank you for being here with me today. Thanks, Georgia. Thanks for having us. So to get us started, can you take a moment to explain to our listeners what water tenure is? How does water tenure affect food security, sustainable livelihoods, and equitable and sustainable development? Yeah, thanks so much, Georgia. I'd be happy to do that. So water tenure, as with land or other resource tenure, is defined as the relationships between people, and that can be both individuals and groups, with respect to their freshwater resources. And this includes not only legally defined and recognized tenure relationships, but also the complex customary or traditional water tenure systems, which may or may not be recognized under state issued laws that govern water resource allocation, use and development in practice for the more than 2.5 billion indigenous peoples, Afro descendants and local communities who collectively steward at least half the world's land mass and actually in sub-Saharan Africa, this includes over 60% of the land, but only hold legal rights to about 10% of that land. And often that includes the appurtenant water resources. Secure water tenure is a prerequisite for these communities' cultural integrity, for their livelihoods and food security, for their health, and for their climate resilience. But these rights are under increasing threat from unsustainable developments, from pollution, land use changes, from demographic shifts, and all of these factors are also being exacerbated by climate change. So legal recognition of communities collectively held, and again, often customarily governed freshwater tenure rights, can provide a critical basis for ensuring that they're able to protect those rights in the face of these threats. Despite the kind of global process that we've seen in improving the security and equity of land, forest, and fisheries tenure, water tenure has actually received far less attention. So to fill this gap, the Environmental Law Institute, ELI and its partner, the Rights and Resources Initiative, RRI, have developed a water tenure tracking methodology to see how well countries are actually recognizing and protecting community-based water tenure arrangements. And we've identified and analyzed 39 of these arrangements across 15 countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And, and this work has, has critically enabled us to identify where the key legal, institutional, and policy issues arise when it comes to their recognition and protection for the most vulnerable groups. And we've We've really been able to leverage this and use this as the basis for contributing to other projects right now. We've also been working with the UN Food and Agriculture Organization to help with the creation of a national water tenure assessment methodology. 
which has been piloted in Senegal, Rwanda, and Sri Lanka. And the findings of this work are kind of providing us a basis for looking at, you know, ways that we can improve livelihoods through more secure water tenure, ways that we can improve equity and sustainable development through more secure water tenure. So some of the key areas that we're looking at at, at moving into that we're doing current research and, and partnership projects on include assessments of how countries are actually legally recognizing their customary water tenure rights and where the gaps exist in that recognition and the implementation of that recognition. And a major finding of our work was that in many cases across many countries, communities' water tenure rights are dependent on their legally recognized land or forest rights, where they have what we call a land water nexus. And this indicates the need for better intersectoral harmonization across laws to avoid undermining communities' tenure security. And then a, a really critical aspect of this, obviously, is focusing on how countries are recognizing and protecting women's freshwater tenure and identifying ways to ensure that these protections are actually embedded in national water policies and laws. I'm thrilled that one of the culminations of this work, building on this and our partners' work over the last five or six years, is the fact that we're now embarking on a global consultative process to be led by the FAO to develop principles of responsible governance of water tenure. ELI has been part of the experts committee under FAO that's spearheading this process. And we're absolutely thrilled that this initiative is going to be announced at the upcoming UN Water Conference in New York. So you talked about how important it is to think about vulnerable communities in this work, in particular women and the rural poor. What does that look like in practice for your projects and why is that so important? It's critically important to focus on the water tenure rights of the most vulnerable. And here, again, we're defining this as indigenous peoples, Afro-descendants, local communities, and then particularly the women within those communities, because the realization of these freshwater tenure rights and the protection of those freshwater tenure rights are absolutely essential to the ability of these communities and individuals to maintain their food security, to have sustainable livelihoods, to be resilient in the face of climate change, and to promote any kind of realistic poverty alleviation and economic development. These are also the rights that are frequently at the lowest level of legal recognition and protection and are most readily threatened when there's competition over the resource or where impacts on water resources, such as pollution from developments, can compromise communities' rights. I would say in particular, women within indigenous and local communities often have the least secure water tenure. Women and girls around the world have critical water management responsibilities, but they also have unique water needs and differentiated priorities for water use and management and play important roles in food production and water management for both household and productive uses. And I think this is something that people often kind of overlook is the role of women in managing water for productive uses. In fact, women constitute about 43% of the world's agricultural labor force but they're a lot less likely than men to have decision-making authority over their water resources. And they also face considerable barriers accessing financial services, markets, technologies that they need to be able to take advantage of their water tenure rights where they exist. Less than a third of the water tenure regimes we studied either recognized or prioritized women's water use or governance rights. And in many cases, national policies, plans, and legislation around water actually fail to articulate any gender equality objectives at all. The UN Environment Program undertook an assessment in 2021 of the status of the water sustainable development goals, and half of all countries reported that they had limited or no achievement of gender objectives in water resources management. 25% of countries reported having no gender objectives at all in their water management policies and plans. So our work is really trying to address this essential gap in national water laws and policies and, and trying to figure out ways in which these gaps can be bridged. And, and one way really is focusing in on national water policies and legislation uh, in terms of promoting more specific recognition and support for women's water tenure rights, because right now most of them are gender blind, meaning that they in practice often reinforce gender inequities and discriminatory cultural norms. And I think one, one other kind of critical aspect of this is the fact that we've, we've really focused in on how often there is what we call a land water nexus, where water tenure rights of communities and particularly the women within those communities are dependent on their legally recognized land and or forest rights. And this is really critical because less than 15% of landholders globally are women. So their water tenure rights can't be adequately safeguarded if their land and forest rights are not also legally recognized and secure. So it means we have a long way to go to unpack these linkages, ensure that the 
laws around both land and water tenure, along with inheritance and marriage, are all harmonized and gender equitable in order to provide a basis for strengthening women's livelihoods and food security. I really appreciate how you explained that even these policies that are so-called gender blind still are not accounting for those really impactful differences in gender that do exist on the ground. So I think that's an aspect of one project that you all have been working on. And this project is with the Women in Water Diplomacy Network, which focuses on empowering women as leaders in high-level decision-making in transboundary basins, using the pillars of gender and youth empowerment, research cooperation, peer-to-peer learning, linkages basin, regional and international water dialogues, and process support. So can you just explain this a little bit more? I know that's full of a lot of jargon for our listeners and you know how all of those pillars interconnect and how they serve as a model. So the Women in Water Diplomacy Network was established by the Stockholm International Water Institute's Shared Waters Partnership Program in collaboration with ELI back in 2017. We had initial focus on the Nile Basin, and this was supported by a number of different development partners, including the United States, Sweden's International Development Agency, the Government of the Netherlands, and the United Nations Development Program. The network really seeks to address some aspects of the gender gap that Jess just elaborated for all of us. But with specific regards to decision making around transboundary water agreements, and with an additional focus on areas that are particularly water insecure or conflict sensitive basins, like the Nile. We have to remember that only about one third of the world's 300 plus transboundary river basins currently have any type of formalized cooperative agreement. This number is lower still for transboundary groundwater aquifers. And this is a really big growing concern given the unsustainable pressure on much of the world's fresh water. About 40% of our global population lives today in a transboundary river basin, and more than 2 billion people get their water from aquifers that are shared by more than one country. Climate change is adding new challenges to this already really difficult situation. We have more unpredictable rainfall, more water-related disasters like droughts and floods, and this makes cooperation over freshwater really critical to human security and global peace. So the Women in Water Diplomacy Network seeks to support more effective, inclusive, transboundary water decision-making that better reflect the societies that they're meant to serve by putting explicit focus on equal participation of women in water diplomacy processes. So we brought together through this network, uh, women water decision makers and diplomats, largely from the ministries of water and foreign affairs across a shared basin and build a community of practice where we can exchange experience and support each other with a shared vision of fostering more improved water cooperation. Since we started the network in the Nile, we've since developed new sister networks, including fantastic network in Central Asia and Afghanistan in cooperation with the Organization for Cooperation and Security in Europe and the Central Asia Regional Environmental Center. The five pillars you mentioned were designed by network members as part of a nine month consultation process to build the network's global strategy, which is called a path forward for women, water, peace, and security. This strategy was released last year at the CV hosted World Water Week in Stockholm. And each of those five pillars that you mentioned really focuses explicit engagement and attention around a critical area and collectively target improved gender equality and high level decision making in transboundary basins. After the strategy was launched, we were thrilled to see new basin communities initiated in several new, to us, transboundary basins in Southern Africa, as well as even initial steps towards the establishment of a network right here in the United States, together with our neighbors in Canada and Mexico. I want to transition to a really exciting achievement. In a few days, ELI, you all will be presenting on water tenure and women's rights at the United Nations Water Conference. Can you give our listeners a little preview as to what you're going to be speaking about there? 
Yeah, thank you so much. It is very exciting. ELI will actually be co-convening with several partners, three side events that are planned for this UN Water Conference in New York City, and they will all take place inside the UN venue, which is exciting. The first is an event that was actually sponsored by the South African government and has a diverse array of UN institutions country representatives, as well as ELI and the Women for Water Partnership. Uh, This event will focus on national leadership for inclusive water governance. So during this session is where we hope that FAO will be announcing the global dialogue on water tenure, and ELI will be able to support that by sharing some of our experiences and findings and kind of drawing the direct line to how critical those are for inclusive national water governance, as well as looking a little bit at the the role of civil society in supporting the global dialogue on water tenure. The second event is sponsored by the International Water Law Association, or AIDA, which ELI is a member and a partner of. And this will focus on integrated, this is a bit of a mouthful, sorry, integrated policy solutions and commitments for sustainable development, conservation, restoration, and sustainable management of freshwater biodiversity. So this event is co-sponsored by UNESCO, IUCN, the Association for Global Water Adaptation, International Rivers, among others. And we'll be able to highlight the work that we're doing under the auspices of the IUCN Environmental Law Commission to promote more integrated national water laws through evidence-based policy and legal analysis of key water law issues. And this will include, not surprisingly, a focus on water tenure. Yeah, we're, we're, we really are excited, Georgia. The third event will put focus on the Women in Water Diplomacy Network which we're really just excited to be part of this important international policy event. The Women in Water Diplomacy Networks event will take place on March 22nd, which is also World Water Day, and it's entitled Elevating Critical Voices in Water Diplomacy. We have a huge consortium. I think we're over 18 partners co-convening this event, including a number of transboundary river basin organizations, regional environmental centers like our partner in Central Asia, several universities and academic institutions, such as the University of Arizona and IIT Delft in the Netherlands, some fantastic youth network organizations, uh, including one in, in Sudan, as well as civil society organizations and think tanks like ELI, CIWI, and the Lincoln Institute. We also are really excited to have some high-level outstanding leaders who will be joining the session to share their support and really speak to the importance of gender equality in water diplomacy, including one of our network representatives from the Orange Saint Coup, representatives from the U.S.-Canada International Joint Commission, which manages shared waters between the U.S. and Canada, Finland State Secretary, and the United States Assistant Secretary of the Department of Interior. So we're really just excited to bring all these uh, important stakeholders together to highlight this important issue at this conference. As a side note, there is a fourth one we're co-convening, which is also going to be a great event. It's going to be held together in partnership with the World Bank, and we'll be putting explicit focus on benchmarking efforts to transparently monitor key gender indicators across water governance institutions. So it's really going to be a great couple of days at the UN Water Conference. It sounds like it. It sounds like a very exciting opportunity. And you were talking a lot about, you know, the different stakeholders and different partners that you're working on in convening these events. And throughout the podcast episode today, we've been talking a lot about the different communities you all work with. And I know your work has a strong focus on social inclusion and specifically on the need for better recognition of customary water tenure rights, as you've explained today. So how do you see ELI's role evolving as we move toward more representative leadership on projects such as these that are so closely tied to community engagement? Thanks, Georgia. It's a a really good and, and very important question. And I would say we have a really phenomenal opportunity, window of opportunity with this global dialogue on water tenure, in which we're really hoping to support much more direct leadership and engagement of our indigenous and local community networks and organizations at the sub-regional level where these dialogues will take place. And ELI is very much hoping to continue to to provide support for elevating these voices, ensuring these networks and organizations are able to voice their priorities, needs, and visions for how to ensure the responsible governance of water tenure. But I I would take a step back and say that, you know, throughout all of our work, 
you know, although we often function at a kind of higher level of looking at governance issues or policy issues, where the focus is really on community rights, we try to engage those communities as as often and as early as possible in various ways. I would say for the water tenure right work that we've been doing, it's important to see that the fundamental aspect of all of that work has been, it's been highly consultative since the beginning. We, we've engaged with partners in the countries and the regions where we undertook our assessments. And we were incredibly fortunate to have the partner, the Rights and Resources Initiative is a global coalition with more than 150 rights holders organizations. And so those organizations were frequently invited to review, engage, uh, comment on the development, implementation, and analysis of our methodology and our findings. And that was that was just a phenomenal way to have perspectives on, on the work that we were doing. But I think it's also important to highlight the fact that the work itself focuses on identifying very specific and, and concrete mechanisms to strengthen and ampl amplify Indigenous and local community voices and decisions and policymaking around water. In Zimbabwe, where I am currently based, we are engaging directly with communities to better understand how they want to be engaged and to provide capacity building on advocacy around water tenure rights. But then, as I said before, this global dialogue, I'm really hoping will provide a chance for us to step back and let, let those indigenous and local community networks really take the lead in terms of providing the kind of input that we need to develop principles on the responsible governance of water tenure that are truly equitable and inclusive. Yeah, that's great that it's both kind of implicit in the process of this current project. And Elizabeth, I'd love to pose a similar question to you. I know you're a senior manager on international programs. And what do you see is the role of outside organizations like ELI more generally in our work in other countries with drastically different cultures, traditions, physical and social landscapes? And how can other organizations doing international environmental work provide support to countries without controlling them or creating dependence on foreign aid? This is a really important discussion. And I think one, a lot of environmental organizations are really engaging positively with more and more. Building on some of the reflections that Jess shared, I would say that the strategy in the Women in Water Diplomacy Network is to think of partners like ELI and others as supporting the process which they are leading in the Women in Water Diplomacy global strategy, we mentioned earlier, there are five pillars. And the first four of those pillars relate to critical issues related to water diplomacy, empowerment, research cooperation, uh, engaging in international policy dialogues, etc. Then the fifth one is something we call process support. And this pillar seeks to provide direct support to the Women in Water Diplomacy Network to effectively implement its global strategy by providing space for organizations and partners like CWI and ELI, among others, to collectively support the objectives articulated by the network's leadership council and its members. This means that organizations like ELI can really play a critical support undertaking areas such as mobilizing resources, fostering partnerships, enabling experience exchange opportunities between and across the basin, supporting monitoring and evaluation efforts, all in the interest of supporting a process like our like the network to achieve its goals. In my experience, this is really a welcome and effective partnership model for organizations like ELI. This is my final question, but as you both know, we are releasing this episode on International Women's Day. It's a good moment to reflect on what ELI as an organization is doing to promote the rights of women around the world and other gender minorities. How have you seen that area of work grow and what more could we be doing? It's important that we recognize that the work that we're doing now and hopefully all of you know the work that we'll be building on in the future is coming from a consistent and really rich history of work at ELI that focuses on community and public engagement as a fundamental core pillar of environmental governance and rule of law. This has kind of been a consistent thread, I think, throughout almost all of the international work that we've done over the last 20 plus years. But I am very happy that we are now have a specific set of projects that are able to highlight and hopefully mitigate 
the critical inequities that are persisting, particularly for women at all levels of environmental and water-related decision-making. And this is from tenure governance at the local community level to women working, as Elizabeth said, as high-level decision-makers on transboundary issues. The principles and the tools are ones that we have consistently focused on, but we're now really able to advocate for real change in national and international laws to recognize these gender inequities and provide, I think, more concrete and meaningful opportunities for women to assort their resource rights and to be meaningfully engaged in decision-making around water at all levels. And as we were speaking of before, for ELI to be able to be kind of a, you know, a fundamental support for those voices moving forward. Absolutely. I I can add that we have a number of exciting events and opportunities coming up to highlight International Women's Day, including the Women in Water Diplomacy. This is the third year in a row that we've hosted an online open event on International Women's Day. The open events for the network provide opportunity for people that are curious and want to get to know the network, what it's doing, how they can be involved, and will take place pretty early in the morning in the North American time zones, but is a great opportunity if anyone is interested. We're also really excited to partner with the UNESCO World Water Assessment Program and the government of Slovenia at a United Nations side event taking place on International Women's Day at the UN here in New York which is part of the annual Commission on the Status of Women program. I'll be joining a panel there and speaking about the essential importance of collecting gender disaggregated data. This is really a key principle of feminist feminist foreign policy in general, but it's really important to all water and environment programs and not necessarily being done to the extent that it should. It simply means we wanna understand how projects affect different parts of the community, different gender communities. And of course, we're keenly aware that quantifiable data on the state of gender diversity in the water sector is really critical to motivating and supporting social and political change. So we're really excited to be able to elevate these things in important platforms such as the UN. Yes, I'm so glad you all have the opportunity to present these important issues on those platforms. And thank you for taking the time to come promote them on this platform, the podcast as well. So that is all I have for today. If you have any final thoughts, you can share them. But if not, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. And I wish you all a happy International Women's Day. Yes, happy International Women's Day. Thank you for tuning in to People, Places, Planet Pod, brought to you by the Environmental Law Institute. We would like to hear from you, so please send us your questions, comments, and ideas to podcast at ELI.org. And if you're interested in learning more about our work, attending one of our events, reading our publications, or becoming a member, please visit our website at www.eli.org.